relation to this disease. This is the latest data from Johns Hopkins University. It's valid as of Friday, the 27th of March at 8 p.m. Central European time. It shows that we are fast approaching 600,000 cases of coronavirus across the world. Here in Europe, Italy and Spain are at the front lines of this disease. They are having to really try and get a grip of the situation. Their healthcare facilities are struggling to cope. Italy's got the highest number of fatalities. It has registered 9,134 deaths, more than anywhere else in the world. Now, in Spain, it is a very rapidly evolving picture. There, the virus is spreading faster than any other European nation. But in the US, there's been such a fast growth that it has now overtaken China in terms of the total number of cases. There are now 94,200 cases over in the United States. In response, governments are now trying to lock down countries so that they can try and contain the spread of this. That's because the virus is spreading faster than ever. To give you an indication of that, at the start of the month, there was on average less than 5,000 cases per day. But now it's averaging more than 50,000 per day. Well, you can send in your questions live. And to find out more on how you do that, let's cross straight over to Alex Morgan in the Cube. Absolutely, Ollie. Well, in addition to being on your television screens, of course, we are coming to you live on social media. There you go. There's the live feed on Facebook. It's also on YouTube as well and Twitter too. So you can leave your comments uh, underneath and we will put the questions directly to the experts in real time. I'll be here. I'll be reading them and we can put those to the experts. So do get in touch, get involved at Euronews on all social media platforms. Thanks for that, Alex. Well, to answer your questions and to give us a sense of where this crisis is heading, we've brought together a group of three experts. In London, we have Dr Natalie McDermott. She's an infectious diseases specialist and an academic clinical lecturer at King's College London. Dr Brock Chisholm is the clinical lead of the UK Psychological Trauma Society. He joins me from Sussex in the UK. And finally, Dr. Isaac Bogosh joins us from across the Atlantic. He's an infectious diseases consultant and associate professor at the University of Toronto. Thanks so much for joining us here on Your News Now. First of all, I'd just like to ask, and I'm starting off with uh, Natalie, how much longer is this situation going to deteriorate? Well, I think that's a difficult question to answer. I think that we're probably going to see it to continue to escalate. Uh, for a period of time in different countries. Uh, and I think once it's settled down in Europe, we're probably going to start to see it escalate in other regions of the world, particularly uh, on the African continent. Dr Bogos, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we've only known this virus has existed for about three months, and clearly some countries are farther along in their epidemics than others. Uh, we're just starting to take off, sadly, in the Americas, uh, whereas, of course, we've seen Asian countries now even start to lift some of these public health measures. So I think, you know, it's, it's, the short answer is we don't know. The longer answer is it's going to be a while. And what does a while mean? We, we need to really be patient here. It's going to be measured in months, not, not weeks. And Dr Chisholm, you know, this is primarily a physical health emergency, but also people's mental health is suffering here and that is deteriorating too. Is that something that you've noticed that as this pandemic has gone on, there's been a rise in complaints about mental health? That's right. We've seen a rise uh, in complaints of mental health, particularly those that have existing difficulties, people with, uh, who, who had previously been struggling with anxiety or depression or trauma-related difficulties. And you can imagine, too, that there will be some people who will have lost family members or who have their own life, uh, which is threatened. So you can imagine it can take quite a toll uh, on our uh, world's global mental health. Thanks so much for those first answers. We're going to go to the questions that we've got now from people on our social media channels. The first one I'm going to give to Dr. Natalie. You also specialise in infectious diseases among young children. So there's been quite a few questions we've had here on Instagram, particularly about pregnant women. The first ones being, can the virus be transmitted through breast milk? And how does the coronavirus affect pregnant women? 
Um, so at the moment, we have relatively limited data on how it affects pregnant women, although I think that amount of data is increasing. Uh, what we understand from China is it doesn't necessarily affect pregnant women particularly badly. Um, and it doesn't necessarily infect their infants when they're born, uh, although it is a possibility if the mum is infected around the time the baby is delivered that the baby be could become infected. But even in those newborns, we've tended to see that most of them have done quite well and haven't been particularly unwell with the virus. Uh, in terms of whether the virus can spread through breast milk, I think that's unclear at the moment. But this virus is so infectious in terms of from uh, coughing and sneezing and being on the hands of the mother, that it's far more likely to spread to an infant that way than it is uh, through the breast milk necessarily. Thanks very much for that. Dr. Isaac Bogosh, I've had a question here from Anki Anka, who says, once you've had COVID-19, can you get it again? And then if it mutated, would that be a different scenario? Uh, that's a terrific question. We're getting this one a lot. You know, in all fairness, we don't truly have an answer for this, but the main consensus now is that if someone is infected with this COVID-19, uh, you know, infection during the course of this pandemic, it's unlikely that they will be reinfected. But of course, we know that viruses change with time, and perhaps if they were infected and are now immune to it during the course of this pandemic, perhaps they could be infected with it in the future. I should preface that with we don't really know. These are just the prevailing theories right now. And Dr. Chisholm, I've got a question here from Adrian Oprea on Facebook. He says, why aren't all people tested? He feels like this is a prison. Well, I guess that's a really a question for the government and for the people that are able to buy and distribute tests. Uh, I fully agree that uh, it would go it would go some way in helping our anxiety and helping to control the difficult and overwhelming feelings that sometimes come from a fear of a, a pandemic. Uh, without more testing, it's unlikely that our anxiety is going to re reduce. But why there are no tests is more a question for the people that make and buy the tests. Dr Chisholm, all of our doctors, thanks very much. We're going to take a quick turn now over to Alex in the Cube and let's see what he's been finding out. Well, of course, Ollie, you can join in this programme at any point, leaving your questions live and in real time. This is underneath our Facebook stream. You can leave any comment on any of our social platforms. I want to just jump in with two questions, though, kind of grouped under this theme of how infectious this virus is and why it's spreading seemingly so rapidly. The first question here is from me saying uh, Japan uh, quarantined a ship, but it found uh, people there with cases 17 days after this quarantine. So they ask, how long can the virus stay outside of the human body? How long can it survive on surfaces, basically? And the second question here is basically asking about the virus, why it is spreading so rapidly through Europe, uh, which they're saying in many areas is less densely populated than uh, southern Asia. But in southern Asia, the virus seems to have been brought to heel. So two questions there, I suppose, all about how this can spread and how long it can survive outside the human body. Thanks very much for that, Alex. Dr. Bogosh, can you answer that for us? First of all, about this cruise ship, the 17 days, how long is this virus surviving? 17 days seems like a very long time indeed. Yeah, that's, that's a bit much. I mean, there's been some very good data addressing this uh, particular issue. And in fact, in one of the leading medical journals in the world, the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a very well-conducted study that looked at this very issue. And they looked at the virus, and they put the virus on different types of materials. They put it on you know, cardboard, on plastics, on metals. And essentially, at the end of the day, they realized the virus can really live for about two hours to two days, depending on the type of surface. Uh, you know, it could still be detected longer than that, but it wasn't really viable. It wasn't able to transmit infection longer than that. So it's really about two hours to two days. And that really reiterates the point about hand hygiene, because, you know, we might be touching various different surfaces throughout the day, elevator buttons, doorknobs, escalator handles, whatever. And, and because this virus can live on surfaces for a couple of hours to a couple of days, it's just extremely important that we be mindful of hand hygiene. Thanks very much for that. Dr. Chisholm, you know, I walk around the house, I clean things almost meticulously now. It's almost gotten to the point, though, where it's an obsessive compulsion. Is that something that we have to be careful of here, that we don't let the virus take over our lives and adversely affect our mental health? 
I think the advice here is to try to control the things that we do have control over, such as hand washing, as is com completely and completely uh, mentioned, but also try to not overly control the things that we, we can't control. So, of course, washing things, cleaning door handles, uh, alcohol rub, and so on. Uh, but when there is not a threat, for example, you're isolating in your house, you're not coming into contact with people, or you're still in, in contact with the same family members, then overcleaning is likely to uh, lead to more difficulties. So just to summarize, try to control the things that we do have control over, but try and sit with the difficult feelings uh, of the things that we can't control. Brock, thanks very much for that. Natalie, I'm going to ask you to try and answer this question from Rizwan that we've got on Facebook. Why is it spreading so much faster in less populated Europe compared to the more highly densely populated Asia? Well, I, I mean, I think that's a good question and it's one that um, we would hope to answer possibly at the end of the epidemic rather than during it at the moment when we can do further studies and understand the dynamics of transmission a little bit better. Uh, we know that China um, isolated Wuhan very quickly when they uh, identified that the virus was starting to spread there. I think perhaps in Europe we had some period of time where we were in a bit of a, a lull thinking that we had managed to contain the virus and not really recognising the power of uh, asymptomatic transmission of the virus within communities. And so I think once we finally uh, recognise that appropriately in Italy, we then uh, already had several weeks of, of the virus probably spreading in Italy before we identified the first confirmed case. And it also happened to time itself quite nicely with half-term holidays or school holidays within Europe. So a lot of people have been travelling to Italy during that time and people who had possibly already been exposed in Italy travelled outside of Italy on holiday. And so we had quite good dissemination of the virus throughout Europe uh, from that holiday period. Natalie, thank you very much for that. I'm going to ask all three of our experts to just sit tight. We're taking a short break here on Euronews. But do remember, you can send in your questions live to us on our social media pages. We'll be back very shortly. This crisis is truly global and has placed huge pressure on the European Union. It's a crucial time for the EU, faced, as it so often is, with unforeseen challenges. The Italian Foreign Minister Luigi Di Maio is my guest in the global conversation to talk about how Italy is facing the COVID-19 emergency on Euronews and Euronews.com.
Hello and welcome back to this special edition of Euronews Now, where we're taking your questions about COVID-19. Now, the World Health Organization says that people's lives are being put at risk by misinformation which is spreading online. For more on this, let's cross straight over to our social media news desk of Cube with Alex. Well, Ollie, I think there's, there's two sort of broad categories here. First of all, there's disinformation, people, people willfully sharing factually incorrect information. That, of course, is very, very dangerous. Then there's misinformation. And let's be honest, look, this is scary. People are afraid, and many people sharing things that they think might help, that might be useful, that turn out to not be. Let me just bring you through some of the key myths that have been busted by the World Health Organization. First of all, questions people saying, well, will the sun kill it? Will low temperatures kill it? Are masks the way forward? What about pills, antibiotics, or in some cases, just drinking straight alcohol? Hand dryers, can they kill the virus? And lastly, garlic. Now, now, that one might sound a bit daft, but overall, when you think about this, if people are using these sort of methods instead of actual information, lives are being put at risk. So what can you do if you want reliable information or you've seen some of these things going around? I advise you to go straight on to the WHO, the World Health Organization's website. They have a myth-busting section, and you can find out not simply why garlic is no use, but also all this talk about masks, how exactly you should use them, when and where. So I think, Ollie, at this time, if I was to say anything, it would be to people to go to the trusted sources. In this case, it's the World Health Organization, and to do their utmost to not spread or share anything um, that might be uh, misleading. Um, and we're also getting uh, a lot of your questions in on social media. We'll bring them to you as soon as we can. Please do send them on all our social media platforms. Leave your comments and we'll take them to our panel live. Alex, thanks very much for that. And let's go straight back to our panel now, going from left to right. We've got Dr. Natalie McDermott. She's an infectious disease specialist from London. Dr. Brock Chisholm is from the UK Psychological Trauma Society. And finally, Dr. Isaac Bogosh is joining us from Toronto. He's an infectious disease specialist. Now, we're hearing there about the myths. And one of the things that I'm finding is that every few hours, family members, friends keep on sending me these messages from WhatsApp. They're all of the same nature. They've got no sources, no nothing, but they've all got a little variation on tips and ways to keep us safe. So starting off with Dr. Bogosh, this whole idea that if we drink little sips of water or if we have hot drinks such as tea, is that fake or is that real? <laughs> it's not going to do anything apart from drinking delicious tea. Uh, it's not going to protect you at all <laughs> from getting a, a COVID-19 infection. So I think we could put that one to rest pretty quickly. Dr. Uh, Bog, uh, sorry, Dr. Chisholm, how much of an impact can things like this have? You know, we are more and more glued to our telephones now. The fact that countries are being locked down, we're on social media a lot more. How much of an impact on our mental health can things like these have? That's a great question, and there's two answers to that. The first is, is that we are more likely to uh, jump to conclusions and to believe the things that we might otherwise challenge. So when there are people that are spreading, deliberately spreading false information or potentially accidentally spreading false information, and normally the accidental ones begin with my friend who knows someone who's a medic or something like that is spread, the filters in our system when we're threatened, the filters in our brain that would normally analyze and uh, filter out what is true and what is false and maybe more logically analyze things doesn't work so well. So we jump to conclusions and we're more likely to believe false information. However, and I would say... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, continue. Do continue. I, I would say, though, that there is a real benefit to social media and things like WhatsApp. At the moment, we are isolated. And we know that when people are feeling anxious or traumatized, one of the things that really buffers the effects of this is to stay in contact with people. Of course, we can't do that. We can only do that from a distance and through social media. So I would absolutely urge people to use, make more use of social media, make more use of internet-based communications, but to, as you say, go back to the World Health Organization and use a trusted source to find out what is true and what isn't true. Brock, thanks very much for that. Just a quick reminder, you can keep on sending in your questions live. You can do that on our social media pages. So we've got Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. So do keep on sending them in. I'm just going to come back to you, Natalie. What's the most outlandish thing that you've heard so far in terms of a health protection benefit that could be used to ward off COVID-19? Um, 
I think there have been a few, but uh, I would probably say uh, the idea of gargling with vinegar or drinking vinegar, because that's probably one of the most dangerous ones I've heard. Uh, a lot of the others are fairly benign, but there are some that are, are relatively dangerous. And the uh, drinking of pure alcohol and the drinking or gargling with vinegar, uh, both of them have the potential to cause significant harm to people. The vinegar, I think, would leave a stench. The alcohol might leave you lightheaded, but that's a completely separate topic. We're going to leave that there for a the moment. We're going to head straight over to Alex in the Cube, though. He's got some more of our questions. Well, absolutely, Ollie. And these are questions looking to the future on our Facebook thread. Of course, you can uh, leave us a comment. We are live. We are taking these questions live. Leave us a comment. Uh, these three questions, they're kind of, sort of grouped around that theme. Well, what about the future? So we've got Faisal here saying, will the virus weaken in the coming summers? The idea here about higher temperatures. We've got other people asking, what will the future be like with this virus still around? And then the last question here, is the virus mutating? So looking to the future of that virus and what form it'll take. So, Ollie, I guess the question here is, is the virus is going anywhere, what will happen to it and what will the future be for us if it's sticking around? Thanks very much for that, Alex. Let's go straight to Dr Bogosh with that. Is the virus mutating? Yeah, I mean, all viruses mutate. So I think when people hear the word mutation, they get terrified and think it's going to turn into some horrendous, worse, more virulent, more dangerous virus. That's not the case. All viruses mutate, and they mutate at predictable, at, at predictable rates. So this virus is mutating, and in fact, we can harness that by looking at the genetic makeup of that virus to really answer some very important questions in terms of when it was introduced and how long it's been in certain places. That doesn't mean it's getting more dangerous. It just means it changes with time. Uh, so I think the, the virus mutation question is, is, it comes up very commonly, and it's important to know that all viruses mutate, and we can actually harness this uh, to really help us understand how this, how this virus has, has moved throughout the world and will continue to move out throughout the world. Thanks very much, Dr. Chisholm. There are fears about the future, isn't there? It's such an unknown. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. And so there are some key concerns going forward about what everything is going to look like afterwards. What are your sort of tips for keeping as happy as possible during this time? Well, some of, some of them I've already said, which is to try and keep in contact with the people that we, we know and, and that we love, uh, but through... Uh, communications other than direct contact. Um, I guess the other thing to say is, again, we can control the things that we can do, such as washing our hands, but there are many things that we can't control, and we'll have to learn to accept that for now. So really not trying to completely predict what is going to happen might be better. Living in the moment, uh, by that I mean focusing on what is important right now rather than worrying about the future but still taking some steps that are within our control is, is really all that we can do right now. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Natalie, I just want to throw in a question here that we got earlier on from Anda Lazar on Facebook. She says, my father-in-law works as a truck driver in Germany. What is the procedure when he comes home in terms of isolation? Is there any sort of catch-all uh, advice that's being given out here, or is it really country to country? Um, I think a lot of that advice is country to country. Um, some of it will depend on his interactions whilst he's uh, been out. If he's largely stayed in his truck and he's been driving and not had contact with many people at all and stayed in his hotel room if he stays in a hotel and, and tried to avoid direct contact with large groups of people, then he's, he's a, a limited risk, really, um, as much as anyone else is a risk. And we know that there is the potential, obviously, that people can be uh, infectious during a period where they don't yet have symptoms. Uh, but if he hasn't had direct contact with anyone, then he's as much a risk as anyone else in Europe at the moment, really. Thanks very much for that insight. We're going to go straight over to Alex. So he's got another question that's coming for us. Absolutely, Ollie. This is a comment from Marco on our Facebook feed. Uh, first of all, he's saying um, good luck to all of us and great job, Euronews. Thank you very much, Marco. That's very nice to have that support at this time. And he's saying here, look, I've been in my house for 18 days with my family. Uh, I'm just wondering how long we can carry on living like this. He said here the Italian government asking people to do it until mid next month, the French government following too. He works, he says, in tourism. He's saying he's presuming he's going to lose his whole 2020 income. He's asking what a government's doing to provide for people after this virus um, recedes. 
Thanks very much for that. Dr Bogos, do you mind answering that? What is, what's the best way for governments to plan for this? What do you think of the current like, evolution of what government plans are? Yeah, I mean, we've definitely seen different uh, patterns and different reactions throughout the world. But I think the central theme here is that many governments are stepping up to really help their citizens. And in fact, they're looking toward individuals, they're looking at small businesses, and they're also looking at big businesses as well. And we're seeing a lot of stimulus packages to really help folks who have been uh, negatively impacted by this virus and are out of work. And I think, you know, my fear of fear here is that, you know, after we see this wave of, uh, you know, physical health issues, uh, infections, and, and after this pandemic sort of starts to die down a little bit, we're going to see a wave of, uh, you know, uh, sadly, you know, deaths and, and uh, uh, issues related to suicide, alcoholism, drugs. And I think we just really need to be mindful that we're going to be in a, 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 an era of um, of economic turmoil, although we're already starting to enter an era of economic turmoil, and we really need to look after one another and be very mindful of our mental health throughout this. Even though we're all focused mainly on physical health right now, I think the mental health component is extremely important, and it will be increasingly important as we start to find new treatments and perhaps even a vaccine for this infection. Dr Isaac Bogos, thank you so much. Same to Dr Brock Chisholm and Natalie McDermott. I'm afraid that is all the time that we've got for here. Thank you very much for sending us your questions. Hopefully you've found the answers a little bit enlightening. I know that this can be an unnerving time, a very uncertain time, but if you follow the advice, washing your hands and trying to take care of our closest neighbours and relatives, then you will hopefully be even more safer. We're going to have plenty more updates here on Euronews, but for the moment, thanks very much for watching.